so everyone, we're going to talk about objection handling today. A uh, couple things before we dig in. Uh, I want to thank our sponsors, Zoom Info and Mixmax. Um, go check out Zoom Info. They're doing a lot of really cool stuff, uh, not only with data, but really just the full tech stack from a go-to-market motion. Uh, go make sure to check their stuff out. They got lots of great content. Uh, Mixmax, I'm super excited to partner with. We have Jack on the show today. I've, I've done a lot of webinars with the Mixmax crew, so it's nice to be hosting you, Jack. Uh, Mixmax is my go-to sales engagement tool. I love how simple and easy it is to use and the templates and the reminders. My inbox, I have helped managing my inbox, but it would be a freaking nightmare uh, without the reminder function. Uh, so I want to thank our sponsors. Quick intro on the guests. Uh, we got Will Aiken, founder at willaken.com. He's got some swag that he wants you to check out, I think, at <laughs> willaken.com. It, it's pretty cool, though. His, his stuff's pretty cool. It's very tasteful, too. Um, we got Jack, SDR manager at Mixmax. We got Abdullah Casino. Did I pronounce your last name right, Abdullah? Spot on. Okay. Uh, sales development manager at Zoom Info. And then if you're seeing uh, our stuff for the first time, my name's Jason Bay. I run Outbound Squad. So we do sales coaching, training, all of that kind of stuff for SDRs and BDRs. So as we talked about objection handling, I thought a fun way to kind of introduce the topic, you guys. Let us know in the chat. And then you guys here, let us know as well. If you get an order and it has cheese on it or something else that you told them specifically not to put on it, do you send the dish back or do you just deal with it? Will, you said you just leave it. Let us know in the chat. What do you do? Jack, what do you do? You send it back? Oh, I, I leave it. I can't. I can't send it back. I just can't. No way. Wow. Okay. Abdullah? Um, I'll, I'll eat the cheese. <laughs> Damn. <laughs> wow, I, I'm, am I the only savage on the Jason, call you today? Seem, no, you seem surprised. Would I you send say, it back? Respect to the yeah, people that can send I, I it would, back. I sure. would respectfully send it back. I would like I, I don't I can't eat cheese. Okay, um, all right, there you go. So if you're lactose intolerant, that makes sense. But cheese normally is extra, so that's like a freebie to me. You yeah. know, if, like a cheeseburger <laughs> is more than just a plain hamburger. So I'm like, whoa, I'm not going to tell them. I'm going to look. That's so funny. The reason I asked this question is for you guys here, is it the discomfort and the awkward confrontation? Does it feel confrontational to say something? Do you feel like you're going to hurt the person's feelings? Do you feel like they're going to mess with your food? Like, why don't you say anything? Sliced cheese isn't worth the effort. I'd rather just dig in. I'm there to eat. And mm. I've been a server. And that means that I'm overly compensating for like, I know how many bad customers there are out there. Um, yeah. But for a sliced cheese, I wouldn't bother. If they probably the entirely wrong dish, of course, I'm going to say something, but uh, something as small as that, I'm just going to chow in. What about you guys? Um, coming from the restaurant industry as well, I would just, you know, have that cheese. It's just the value of time, I'm not waiting for another burger. And I know it's just going to taste as good. And it's not like if it was something I was allergic to, yes. But if it's something like, you know, an additional, an add-on per se. So I would I would take that freebie all day. Yeah. And I think for me, huge cheese guy. So if they accidentally give me more cheese or cheese I wasn't expecting, so easy enough. But yeah, also too, I think if it was like an entirely different meal, something I was not, then yeah, that that one I'll be hey, like I think y'all got this wrong. But yeah, it's all, but more so, it's the awkwardness for me. I just can't. It's just like <laughs> yes. So let, let's kind of talk about that real quick because this is how I like to set up objection handling is that. If it feels awkward for you to address it, that confrontation, I think knowing how to do something in a way that actually invites a person to be honest with you and to care for you in that moment versus just avoiding the confrontation altogether, there's really an art to that. And a lot mm. of prospects, when you think about when someone says not interested or I'm about to hop into a meeting, a lot of times they're just straight up lying to you and it's instinctual in most cases. But it's less time and it's less confrontational for me to just make up something real quick and just tell you that I have something else going on than for me to tell you that I don't like you, I'm annoyed by the call or to get frustrated or to say we already have a provider. It's just easier and less confrontational to lie to you. And I think one of the big things with objection handling, this is where we're gonna kind of start you guys. And for the rest of you, as you have questions, please drop them into the Q and A. We wanna make this as interactive as possible for you today. I think one of the first things that we want to do with objection handling is let's not try to handle the objection right away. Let's just get to a point to where we can actually have a genuine dialogue and back and forth with mm -hmm. the prospect. So now that I've kind of, you know, kind of set this up, let's dig into kind of the mindset component 
of objection handling, knowing that, hey, we want to get this person to a point to where they can be genuine with us. Let's start, Abdul, I'll kick this first question your way. How do you think about, because you've been in the game for a while, you're leading teams of people, the mindset from a rep's standpoint, what kind of mindset is going to serve us when we get these objections? How, where do we want our head to kind of be? Um, I feel like objection handling kind of starts with your your energy, right? Like your your energy on the phone. I always say that like you have the ability to kind of up uplift someone or if your tone on the phone is a little bit like on a lower end, you have the ability to kind of indulge in someone being angry at you. Right. So the mentality yeah. is like, have that, have that high energy. And, you know, you're just having a conversation. You're having a human to human conversation. As long as you're confident in the product, you will be in an okay spot to have that conversation. Cause unless you're talking to a previous customer, which is going to be a more interesting conversation or someone who has never heard of your product before, you are going to be the expert in that, have that energy. You're teaching somebody be joyful in that. So more of a teaching approach rather than, hey, I'm making another cold call. So your energy is everything in that. Yeah. Comments, Jack, Will, like energy, vibe, without being, we're not trying to go to the crystals yeah. place for everyone watching with this. <laughs> we're not trying to be super woo-woo here when we say energy. Oh, I was about to light the <laughs> incense like up there. Um, <laughs> well, I, I think ahead, um, to, uh, to, to, to Abdul's point that the energy is in my mind it's like okay you got to detach from the outcome but you got to show that in the way that you approach it as well don't be nervous don't be overthink it like it's all good you're just having fun if it doesn't go well it doesn't go well if it goes well it goes well right but like to show that to the prospect it, it, it takes that mindset as well and it'll come through in the way you speak the tonality the speed the pacing that's why it's helpful to just put on a smile because those people are easier to talk to and if you can lower your guard then the prospect is likely to, to lower theirs and, and reciprocate that so you got to come without guard to get rid of all the stuff that makes you sound you know like you're nervous out of place uh yeah i i um, want to um, double click on the smile piece because this is what i was taught because i come up in call centers and it's yeah. we used to put little uh pocket mirrors in the cubicles and the thing was hey you need to see your teeth when you're talking and the smile really radiates through the phone hmm the kind of idea that I always like to share with reps is I want it to be really hard for you to be an asshole to me as a prospect. That's the type of energy that I want to bring in. Like you would feel like a, an absolute jerk if you were mean to me. Um, Jack, what about you in terms of like mindset, like approach, style? Yeah. We're going to talk for everyone watching and listening. We're going to give you like how to handle like every objection. We're going to like do a round table on that part. Yeah. But I think this part is the part that's a little tougher than knowing the exact words to say, but what are your thoughts on like mindset, like how you approach it, maybe the style that yeah. you take when you're objection handling, that sort of thing. Yeah. So for me and my team, I'm sure they're on this call. I'm a big mindset guy. Like, yes, everything else is there from like whatever scripts you have or talk tracks, but it all starts with mindset. So if you go into every call, putting pressure on yourself, like I need to book meetings, like this is what I need to do, but you're just, you're not setting yourself up for success. But the mindset shift that I've seen in a lot of reps is when they go into it of you're just having a conversation. You're not trying to sell every single person because more than likely, no, not everyone's going to be a great fit for your solution. It's just how it is. So at that point, look at it as I think someone said it in the chat, human to human. That's all you're trying to do at this point. Connect on a humanly basis. You're also trying to break down those barriers and you can't do that effectively if you're just a robot or, you know, you got to find your, you, the reason why you're a seller is because you have some characteristics that really make you who you are. So exploit those, like really make, make those your own and make it uh, how it is. And also too, we've said this on a few of my different webinars, like the trend is, or the relationship is sellers chasing and selling the prospect. The prospect is trying to avoid and run away. So try to disrupt that pattern as much as possible. And to be honest, it's just being genuine, having that conversation, human to human. And Having a, I mean, especially for the account executives watching, having a, a full-ish pipeline allows you to not be so needy coming into that call where you don't need the meeting so bad. You, you never want to, you, you always want to be coming from a place of abundance. And people talk about abundance a lot from a mindset standpoint, but really what creates abundance is actually having it. <laughs> like if you have abundance in your pipeline Ooh. or abundance of money and don't actually need it, you don't have to pretend to have an abundant mindset. 
Um, Perfect, there's go. a couple things in the in the chat I thought were really good. Um, Dan says, let the issue be fo be the focus around the item and not about the person. If someone is mean, that is their head trash, not your identity. I mean, this is the reality of cold calling is most people don't like to be cold called. But in terms of people being a jerk to you, it's it's one out of 10 people maybe are going to be a jerk to you. And worst case that happened is that they hang up on you or they say something kind of rude. So if we can kind of go and not really needing anything from anyone, that's a great place to start. Um, Will, I want to kick this question your way before we dig into some of the tactics here in a second. Um, we had talked about when we were preparing for this, styles of objection handling. And we had talked about, hey, there's kind of this disarmingly blunt approach that you can use that I've heard a lot about. There's this kind of genuine, persistent approach. That's more my style. You strike me, and I've listened to you make cold calls before recently on a LinkedIn Live. You seem to have this disarmingly blunt thing down pretty well. Um, but how would you describe your style with this? And if someone wants to be a little cheeky uh, about it, if that's the right word, any tips or what does that sound like maybe, like from a tonality standpoint? And feel free to provide an example if you want. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's just... um. It's knowing about who you are and what you're comfortable doing as well, right? So over the next 45 minutes, while we run through like a few different ways to handle objection, you might go, oh, I can't, I just can't see myself saying or doing that. It just doesn't sound like me. That's a natural feeling and recognizing that and figure out what can work for you is like a lot of sales. It's why a lot of like, there's no silver bullet. Every seller is different. Every buyer, every industry is different. For me, like, I guess my approach is just like, at this point, I don't, really care i do still get a little bit nervous when i haven't made cold calls in a while that's 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 natural but also like we were talking before this i don't really need the meeting as well so it doesn't really matter what happens I just, i'm just there to have a good time and, and 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 if i can book a meeting that's great um generally my style is just like you said if i if i think of something or i'm curious about something i'll ask the question up front um if someone gives me an objection then I'll just lay out for them and say, yeah, this is the deal. Well, you know, I'll, I agree totally with you. It's just, it's not coming out any kind of combative way, but still being willing to just go, Hey, here's a question for you related to that. Um, but I think the main thing about style is just figure out what you are, who you are and what sounds right coming up your mouth. So that could take some practice and repetition to get there though. Yeah. And just getting super comfortable and people are giving you a hard time in the chat. Laura says his accent doesn't hurt. I would agree. Oh, I will admit that. I won't lie. Being in North America, all my old colleagues, when I used to make cold calls, they'd be like, well, it doesn't count that Will booked the most means because he's got the accent. I'm like, yeah, I'll put one on then. It's all right. Uh, Jason, can yeah. you do a British accent? Can't do a British accent. That's, that's yeah, not see, as good. Yeah, see, there you go. You just, you just, you just, <laughs> you connect, you connect conversation rate just doubled me. Um, <laughs> this, this Jason, with that, okay, I'm going to stop doing this. <laughs> okay. Anyways, I digress. So uh, let's talk about this. So I think the first key strategy with objection handling is let's kind of like create different buckets uh, for the types of objections. So if we're thinking about the types of inject objections, we have called these like brush offs on one hand, and then you have like your more logical objections on the other. I think to make it really simple, we could say there's very emotional, reflexive, off the cuff objections. So if someone says not interested, not right now, et cetera, et cetera. In the first 30 seconds of speaking with them, that's usually a, a reflexive response, no different than, I don't know about you guys, when I walk into a shopping mall and I see a salesperson trying to grab my attention out of the corner of my eye, I don't even think about it. I try not to make eye, I do exa exactly what Jack did there. I try <laughs> not to make eye contact because I just don't want to interact with them. I don't even think about it. It doesn't even matter. They could say, hey, we have a 50% off coupon for the thing that you wanted to come in here and buy. And I just wouldn't even listen to them because I'm so like just reflexive. Like I'm so trained to ignore them. And then on the other hand, you have more of the legitimate logical objections. It's like I'm a minute and a half, two minutes into a call and someone's like, you know, we're using your, your competitor or we're already getting the job done doing something else. If we use this as a starting point, Jack, I'll kick this first question your way. Um, how do we want to think about the way that we respond to each of those two types of objections Yeah. in terms of like what the prospect kind of needs in those situations? We have that instinctive, emotional, kind of reflexive objection like we talked about and then the more logical one. 
how do we want to think about the the ways that we might respond to those differently? Yeah, so in a way, they're kind of similar when you think about them, because at the end, there's still objections. And I think what we touched on previously, and Will did a good job mentioning it, but like that genuine, you know, just being dis disarmingly blunt. My style, too, is disarmingly blunt with that genuine side, too. So it's kind of like a mix of both, but you get hit with not interested, own it. Hey, not surprised. You're not interested. I called you out of the blue. Like start there. Kind of just disarms them a little bit more, get into it. But then even a logical ob objection too, you can get more into the weeds into it. Cause now you have some more information beyond just like the bare smoke screen, uh, not interested. But I think just again, being transparent, kind of own it. Hey, I don't blame you for not being interested. I just called you out of the blue, but this is why I was calling you. You know, does it still make sense? Does it still not sound like something you're interested at this point? So kind of just being honest with them. And I, that's what I've seen a lot of uh, from me too. And the difference for me is not panicking and just owning. Mm -hmm. And actually I have a weird thing too. I go in every call. I'm obviously hoping for the best, but I'm prepared for the worst. So I'm prepared for, they're going to tell me I'm not interested. They're going to kick and say, hey, kick rocks, Jack. So now I'm like, way ahead of it and hopefully it'll, I'll have enough ammo behind me where I feel way more confident and I'm ready for it so that's kind of helped me in my mindset and just approach going into it so let's dig into this you guys because this is like the actual framework it's very simple hmm. I've seen this displayed in a lot of different ways and called a lot of different things but this is essentially it when I get an objection I don't want to like handle the objection quote unquote right away and there was a whole like controversy over whether you should handle objections or not. Like, let's just like, we don't have to come up with a fancy name for it. It's objection handling, but we want to greet the objection first. And what I heard you say just now, Jack, is let's, let's kind of go through the not interested objection first, you guys. And mm -hmm. while we're doing this, let us know in the chat, what's the objection that gives you the toughest time on your cold calls? Drop that into the chat for us and let's make a little list of these objections and we'll kind of work you guys through this framework that you see on my screen. Let us know in the chat, what's the what's the objection that gives you the toughest time? And hopefully for those of you looking at the chat, this makes you feel a little better because these objections, in my experience, training a lot of different companies that sell to a lot of different people, it's basically all the same objections. Yeah. I think that's and the I'm beauty say, of cold calling, honestly. <laughs> I was going to add to this because I'm so like, I think I have it in a, in a way really nice now because I'm getting sold to. So I'm kind of like picking up on, oh, like I would want yeah. my rep. But when I've get, gotten cold called and I still have this call in my head, uh, I was on paternity leave. Guy called me. I picked up. I said, hey, man, I'm currently on leave, but send me an email. But when I return, if it looks interesting, he totally did not even engage with what I just mentioned. He just went right in to ask like this talk track of how to approach like a not interested. I don't know, but it turned me off completely. So I think that I can't emphasize it more. Do not just disregard what they just said, acknowledge it, greet it, and then respond. Can't. Yeah. Yeah. Acknowledge, greet, like show that you're listening, that sort of thing. Um, I think that like one of the really easy things to do with this greet piece, no matter what kind of objection that you get, is to just say something like, got it, or hey, totally understandable since I'm calling you out of the blue. Something like that along those lines in your own words is a great way to acknowledge the objection. Um, let's go just kind of round table. Uh, Abdullah, with your reps and when you're doing this sort of stuff, not interested. Let's say that they get that objection in the first 36, uh, 30 seconds or so, because that's oftentimes where it happens. Mm. How do we respond to that? And and feel free to give us some context into kind of the framework too, because <laughs> I think there's two components of this. There's this, we're going to give you guys examples. And what we hope that you don't take from this is that you just like copy and paste exactly what we say and try to use it in a very scripted way. So feel free also to just kind of talk about the thought behind it in the framework as well. But Abdullah, so... Prospect gives you not interested. How do you, how do you recommend handling this one? Yeah, absolutely. Um, when prospects saying they're not interested in the first thirty seconds, I'm assuming they probably haven't heard what we do, anyways. So flat out, just hey, what are you not interested in? Right. Get the conversation going and see what they have to say. A lot of the times, if they're just trying to push you off the phone, they're gonna say along the lines of ah, you know, whatever you're calling about, whatever you're selling to me. Um, and you kind of just follow that path of like, hey, um, I know I'm catching you out of the blue, 
I'm calling from Zoom Info, explain what your company does. And does that sound familiar to you, right? And from there, they're going to tell you not interested again. And you kind of just dive into, you know, what are you not interested in? Do you already have something in place? I go on the route of more persistence when it comes to objection handling. So I get curious about what they need and see where I can fill in our products and services, right? Zoom Info and on our side, we're lucky enough to be a full go-to-market platform. So when it comes to anything has to do with sales or anything, just going to market, we can really fill those spots and just better understand what they're not interested in. So you like to go the route and I'll kind of drop as much as I can in, in this into the chat for everyone. You like to go the the professional persistence route, which is, I, I feel like if you put a big smile on your face, that is like the cheat code for being persistent. Um, so not interested. Oh, yeah, curious. what aren't you interested in? And just letting them talk. And then usually they'll give you another excuse. And then you explain the reason for your call again. There's, I think one of the big things with this is some people are like, well, if I explain the reason for my call again, and I do that twice, I'm just repeating myself. Is that okay? I'm like, yeah, because there's two modes that your prospect is in. And I've talked mm -hmm. about this a lot. Um, there's type one and type two uh, kind of modes that your prospect is is in. It's in, from a book, Thinking Fast and Slow. You know, type one is like this instinctive mode where you're not listening. It's the mode you're in when you're driving or brushing your teeth. Type two is this more like calculated, like someone swerved in front of me. I'm now like, ooh, my pupils are dilated. I'm paying attention now. You have to get them out of system one and get them into system two. So repeating yourself is not a bad thing to do, is my point. Um, Will, what about you? How do you approach this objection? Not interested. Yeah, I'm um I'm gonna disagree with you, Jason, a little bit. All right. Not no, not no, like obviously, like we said, everyone's love it. approaches, but that makes it more entertaining like, for, for I everyone. find those <laughs> knee jerks, they they often happen as a result of whatever we said up front just didn't land. So it either sounded too much like other salespeople or you know, just it, it, they just kind of went onto autopilot mode, right? So, like, one to avoid this pattern interrupt, do your research, have a good reason for reaching out, something that sounds totally different to what they're used to. Um, but if someone says not interested, straight up on the front of the call, then that tells me what I said didn't land. So, what I'm going to do is take a step back, do what you said, which is this exact framework. That framework's pretty much what everyone's going to tell you about knee jerk reactions acknowledge and then probe, ask, respond, whatever it is. I then put it on myself because what I want to do is try and get their guard down. And one of the best ways to do that is to put a smile on someone's face. If I've already got one on mine, if I can make fun of myself a little bit, like that's fair game. We are the easiest people to make fun of on the planet. Self-depreciation, it's a safe bet. So I could just be like, hey, you're not interested. I didn't quite get into the reason for my call. So I must have really blown up front. Or, or is it that? And then I can go X problem and kind of touch on a different problem to maybe the one I left with isn't so much of an issue for you right now or something you've already looked into. That's a compound question, but isn't so much of an issue for you right now. So then I can get them still to rethink it, but I can use a second problem so I can start even just trying to switch up, but also trying to get them to laugh at the fact that I'm like, I must've really sucked, you know, <laughs> like, and, and, and then they're like, oh, this person doesn't take them too seriously. And if they crack a smile, then boom, we're in. Yeah. He, with the accent, you, you have that, uh, Let's not cut you don't don't attribute who's all my the, success uh, to accents, Jason. That's not fair. Damn it. Who's, I'll put an American the, one on for the rest of the webinar if you like, or an Australian one. <laughs> who, who's uh the like early two thousands rom com Grant? Uh, he's in a uh, lot of movies. Like, oh, Hugh Robert. Grant. Hugh Grant. Yeah. Hugh Grant. Like oh, Hugh Grant. Thanks. That's kind of like the self deprecation. Like that yeah. energy, I find to be like really helpful. Um, okay. <laughs> Daniel says, "Does anyone know of a good accent school?" <laughs> you guys are hilarious. Uh, I'm launching a new course next month. Uh, I'll teach you, teach you the way. There we go. <laughs> yeah, I'm not even. I'm um, not even British. This is all fake. I was born in uh, Maine. Uh... <laughs> so self-deprecation, Jack. What are your thoughts on this one? Because this is like all of the conversational intelligence data I've seen is 80 percent of the objections, 80 to 90 percent of the objections that most uh, sales teams get are these blow-off objections. It's like not interested. Send me an email. Oh, it's yeah. most of the time this type of stuff. Um, so the not interested, how do you recommend handling that one? I'm very similar to Will. Will, we're on it right now. Cause I love being self-deprecating myself, uh, because just owning, I, mean, I think Mixmax, we are in a like funny spot cause we're selling to salespeople. They know why we're calling, they know what's going on. So just owning that, bringing yourself down to make them feel good and laugh a little bit, tends to open that dialogue up more, but also too, 
I think I've told my reps this like Mixmax, we've been around since early, uh, I think around 2010 is when we officially started to launch. Uh, people still don't know us. We're the new kids on the block. I still say in the sales engagement space, we still have a lot uh, to prove. And so if you're any, anyone in the, you know, on the webinar today, if you're in that similar mo motion, your prospects probably haven't heard of you. So they're probably just going to push you off to the side, not interested. So taking that step back, maybe your approach is self-deprecating like me and Will, which helps. I've seen good success with it, but also just kind of taking that step back and reapproaching it and, you know, starting over in a way. Hey, I mean, my, you know, this is a cold call. I pro most definitely blew it. That's what I got from that here. Let me take a step back really quick. This is why I was calling. That tends to help. I've seen a lot of success with it. My reps have their own way about it where they go in right off the cuff saying, hey, uh, is this Jason? Hey, Jason, this is Jack. You're going to hate me. This is a cold call. Um, do you have 30 seconds for me to explain why I decided to call you today? And that tends to be really good. They're already approaching it. They're already kind of self-deprecating in a way you're going to hate me. Um, not saying that's like a secret sauce for everyone to use, but anyway, that self-deprecating motion, I really like. Yeah. I love that. Like the fall on your sword kind of thing is what I've heard people call it too. Yeah. I, I teach something very similar to like Will and Jack, like that approach. And it's always going back to, I, I think that the best way to handle objections is when you can deliver a customized response that based on your research and what you know about those personas to be true. So something like that might sound like this. Oh, Jack, you know, that's like, I totally missed the mark there. Usually when I'm speaking to call center leaders like yourself, reducing cost to serve is a really big priority. And, and like just too many people are calling in and not self-serving through FAQ pages. Is, is that by chance in your wheelhouse or am I totally barking up the wrong tree? That's, that's so being that's it. super specific, Funny. like you got to know these things, like the best way to cold call and objection handle is to know generally the people that you're reaching out to what they care about. Hmm. So you guys got a couple different styles there. Both can work. So we're going to keep moving. Let us know in the chat if you guys got questions or in the Q&A as we're going through this. Let's dig into about to hop into a meeting, which honestly is a very similar way that you handle this objection. But we'll do that one, and then we'll do the send me an email one next. Uh, Will, let's start with you this time. Prospect says, I'm about to hop into a meeting or some version of that, right? You caught yeah. me in a meeting. I'm leading a meeting. I'm about to hop into a meeting. You know, it's 1036 a.m. They're clearly not about to hop into a meeting at that time. But how do you how do you recommend handling this one? I, all, all these knee jerk types of ones are going to be very similar sounding. I have a little bit of a different first word and then I go back into that repeating of the problem so if they say I'm going to a meeting I'm going to go oh my bad look I know I'm calling it the blue here and I could have given you a heads up I was planning to call rather than just kind of catch you off guard again and then and go you know problem x or like you just said the call center one um is that focus for you right now or am I uh, totally off the mark um so just acknowledge again say yo you're going to a meeting I should have given you a heads up that you're going to call basically when you take that away from them I think even like I remember reading this like in a book, Never Split the Difference. Everyone's probably heard of this one. It's like the most yeah. overread book in sales. It's like an accusation order. If you say all the bad things about yourself, then you take them away from the person you're talking to and they naturally almost want to go, oh, no, it's okay. You, you don't have to tell me you're calling and all that stuff. So again, just agree with them, but almost like over agree with them in a way, like really lean into like, you're so right. I should have given you a heads up. I was going to call. Um, and then basically switch it back around and ask a question. So you mentioned something that I'm going to drop this into the chat. That's so important. Uh, Lyle, it's never split the difference is the book. Um, <laughs> Megan says, what was that second cheesy book? <laughs> that second cheesy book? <laughs> it's actually a really good book. Although... It's a really good book. I read it on vacation. It's like the only like vacation yeah. sized book in my collection, but everyone in sales raves about this book. I think it's, yeah. there's some, definitely some takeaways in there, especially when it comes to like questioning. Oh, it's really good. Yeah. Yeah. It's very good. Um, okay. You mentioned something there, Will, I think is so important with these knee jerk objections, acknowledging the interruption is really what the prospect needs in that moment. It's no different than like, if I was walking, Jack, let's say that we're walking to go get coffee somewhere and I step on the back of your shoe on accident. If I don't say, oh, my bad, man, you're kind of going to kind of be like, dude, like what the heck, man? <laughs> like, you're not even going to say anything. You just stepped on my shoe. You know, or if I yep. spilled coffee on you a little bit and it just didn't say anything. And 
you're not calling out the obvious thing that the prospect is thinking. I didn't ask you to call me. So just owning that, it like re relieves this tension in the conversation. So I don't want to gloss over that because that's a very intentional thing, like acknowledging the interruption. Oh, I should have given you a heads up. I'd be calling. Uh, I like saying, hey, it sounds like you're keeping you busy over there. I'll make it quick. The reason I was reaching out to you was, and then I just do the same thing. I think that people treat, I'm about to hop into a meeting like, oh God, I can't talk to the person right now. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, let me make it quick. Because your odds of getting that person back on the phone, pickup rates are three to 5%. And it's probably even less the second time you try calling someone. So you have like a, a three or five and 100 chance of getting that person to pick up the phone. They picked it up, like take advantage of that time. Uh, Jack. What about you? Anything that you do differently than Will with this objection? So I actually, I, I'm what you just mentioned, Jason, uh, I'll make it quick and keep the conversation going. Hmm. Like make sure you're keeping the conversation going. Cause this actually, I have uh, one of my reps, he got hit with that. Like, Hey, I'm about to hop into a meeting or I think it was something, maybe I'm in a meeting. I don't know. Uh, that meeting, I think it was 30 seconds in turned into like a 12 minute cold call. So evident they were not in a meeting. He kept the conversation going and he, he started off with uh, something along the lines of, ah, you know, t that's totally my bad here. I'll make it really quick. And then right from there, he started asking questions on what they're using for sales engagement today. You know, whatever sort of qualifying discovery questions y'all have, but it's funny. You just, you never would think that one little line and then just ask, and I'm really big about ask questions and keep them open. Do not ask closed questions, like make sure they have to keep uh, an open conversation running and it's not just one word answers they give you. Um, but yeah, I like the, I'll make it quick and then get into it, but always in a way finish with a question, at least in the beginning stages. So then they're at least engaged with you and they have to respond in an open way. Yep. Keep it going. Abdullah, it anything going. you do differently? Um, pretty much the same stuff and just getting into the fact of like, Hey, once the conversation is going just to make sure that this is worth connecting again, Right. If they're they're truly in a meeting, because like, you know, the reality of it, if you're picking up the phone, what, like all of us here, if you're picking up the phone and say you're in a meeting, you're not in it. Right. Everyone that's picking up is not in a meeting. So kind of keeping that conversation going and seeing if it's worth connecting again. Um, this is a play I heard, like, I think it might have been from one of these webinars from a year back where, you know, if it is worth connecting again, send that five minute calendar invite right, to, to the prospect, hey, this is just to serve as a reminder if, you know, to, so I can give you a call again and then potentially send some value add. And from there, hey, I wanted to see if we could extend this meeting, make it be 20, 30 minutes, and I'll have you connect with our product specialist and talk through some of these questions that you have, right? So like the ultimate goal of booking that meeting, instead of making another call, we have them on a meeting um, and we already have that invite on the calendar. So just some quick tweaks there. By the way, we're going to share a link to get this to you guys afterwards. We have a whole guide that's got all of this stuff written out. It's got it's responses. Generosity. So just, so just hang on, you guys. We'll we'll share it with you at the oh. end. Um, let's answer Ryan McCormick, uh, his question. What about offering to call them back later? And let's kind of broadly answer this, like objection handling in general, hmm. providing an option that I can call you back later. What are your guys' thoughts on that? Uh I kind of hate it. I, I'm, I, I'm, I'm not to like rag on any one method because I said there's tons of different ways you can approach it. But I just know that when I've either got someone said, call me back later, back when I was in a call center, I was calling B2C or even in B2B and they're like, call me back in five minutes, call me back in an hour. Like they never pick one percent of the time they pick it up, right? So <laughs> if, I, if I lose yeah. it, they're gone, right? So what I'd rather do is just try and make that 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 time happen because I know chances are I'm probably never to catch them again. Um, but I'm going to do that in a way that doesn't make them feel trapped. And sometimes that can be offering an out as well, right? If someone's really resisting you, you go, hey, look, like this is why I'm calling. If we, if we have a quick chat and we find out this isn't relevant, what I could do is like what they want is for you to leave them alone forever in some cases, right? You can offer that as an out. You go, look, if we talk and it's not relevant, I will delete your information from our database and make sure no one from my company ever calls you ever again. Like you're like, yeah. if you need to start offering something because that's what they want. What you want is to learn more about them and uh, get shoot your shot. So it can help to just, if you need to go at the same objection twice. That's what I do. Love it. Cool. Let's keep moving, you guys. Send me an email. I feel like this one, 
like, let's be real here. Let us know in the chat, what percentage of the time have you sent an email to a prospect that asked you and they respond and say, yes, let's book a meeting. Give me that percentage if you had to guess in the chat. Send me an email. I've already sent you seven, Jason. You ignored them. That's why I'm calling yeah. you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, some people are like, oh, Jill, what's up, Jill? <laughs> Jill says once, only once. Someone said negative 10%. <laughs> um, so like, it's a, like, I like thinking of sales and especially outbound as a game of odds. So like you're constantly trying to play the thing that has a higher chance of success. The lowest probability of success is going to be just complying and sending an email and hope that they respond to it. That's going to have the lowest percentage chance of success. So there's other things that we can do here. Um, Jack, let's, let's kick this question your way. Yeah. So prospect says, send me an email. Give us maybe kind of the thought behind how you might respond to that and let us know generally how that might sound. Yeah. So, I mean, going back to, you know, the greet and respond, you know, hey, happy to send you an email. I have so much to send your way. Curious, what have I said so far has not resonated with you to want to meet further, or at least look at what we have? That's kind of, you know, you're greeting the objection saying, hey, I'm happy to send you an email. I have way too much to send your way. But just curious, what have I not said so far that's got you convinced you should be meeting with me or my team? That is a really effective one that we've seen really well. But funny enough, we've actually seen um, some success with if you absolutely can't get around it, they're still, hey, I get it. You're a great sales, uh, great sales Jack, but you got to send me an email. Like I have to, you know, I'm, I'm busy right now, whatever. I think at that point, be blunt and asking, hey, OK, I'm going to send you an email within a minute five minutes after this call, what do you expect to see in that email? Because I want to make sure I get it right. I think that's a really important one because now not only are you acknowledging it, but if they're really resistant and they are super about, hey, I got to see an email come from you, make sure you get their feedback as what they want to see on that email and you put it in that email. Do not get it wrong. Um, but I'm also the same way with, uh, you know, you just have to make sure you're you get as much as you can out of that call so that you actually have a valuable email to send to them but uh, i'm definitely more of don't send an email please don't rely on that email callback try to get as much out of it and book at least a 15 minute extra like intro call yeah. to get them on i'll give you guys another pro tip too so i do something very similar jack to you if the person really just will not leave without uh you agreeing that you're going to send an email I say, how about this? I'll put a calendar invite on the on the uh, for tomorrow for five minutes, Jack. If you like what you see in the email, let's keep the call. If you don't, feel free to cancel and decline it. And you do that five minute meeting where it's like give them a chance and a deadline, and you've always you've got a next step that way too. Mm -hmm. I just I I haven't found any like conclusive data on this. But you just know that when you don't have a next step on the calendar, the likelihood that you continue the conversation is extremely low. So that's just something you can pull out of your back pocket. That five minutes, hey, let's put five minutes on the calendar on Friday at noon. If you like what you see, let's keep the meeting. And if you don't, feel free to totally delete it. Yeah, I like that. Abdullah, Will, anything different from you guys on the send me an email objection? There's totally a disarmingly blunt way to handle this one too. Yeah. Um, I, I'm never going to call someone out and be like, I have sent you emails or like, what? So you can't So you, what? So you can ignore that thing is buyers are always, if you, if, I spoke to like eight C-level execs at different levels, different size companies, procurement, CTO, CIOs. And I interviewed them just to figure out what was making the tick. Every single one of them said, if people could prospect me one way, I gave them the option, what channel would you choose? They said, we'll choose email. And I asked why, and they said, because it's really easy to ignore, right? So that's what they want. Like, if we go to email, we're putting ourselves on the back foot. We're lucky that we even got them on the phone. So again, I'm going to just go, <clears throat> yeah, yeah, I'm totally happy to send you an email. The, what, the last thing I'd want to do, though, is send you something that's come total junk and completely irrelevant. Um, what, what? And then I'm going to ask a question, then just continue the conversation. What are you doing? How are you doing this today? What are you doing to do this? What are you doing to prevent this? And then keep going. Like uh, Jack's story earlier, a lot of the time they'll just stay on the phone for another seven minutes and have a full conversation with you. Um, as long as you just don't let that thing shut you down right there and then. Um, as long as you can ask it, and it helps as well if you can re reiterate the relevance of why you're reaching out, the research you may have done on them, the the problems that you have solved. I would always keep coming back to those. 
because those are some things that set most sellers rack, lack who are calling them. Like most cold calls I get, and I'm someone who picks up every cold call I get because I want to listen to different people's approaches. And if I like something, I can nick it, um, steal it. Sorry, that's British slang. Um, <laughs> But like 90% of the ones I get, the B2C ones, they're all like very scripted sounded, very like out, you know, very just, they don't sound like they're on the very sharp. You know what I mean? They're not on the money. Whereas the 10% who are like, oh, this person's worth listening to. They know something about me. They've done their research. I'll give those people a lot more time. And I'm often a lot more blown away with those people. And those people are the people who can sell me something that I didn't even think I needed half the time as well. Um, well that said, salespeople are, uh, are easy sales once you've got them because they know all the tricks, right? Yes. Yeah. Christy LeBlanc dropped something into the chat that that's that more disarmingly blunt approach. I do it sometimes. Disarmingly blunt is not totally my style, but just saying, hey, you know, I'm happy to send you an email, Will, but just level with me here. <laughs> Most of the time when I speak with people, they want me to, they say they want an email, but it's really just a polite way of saying they're not interested. Is, is that the case here? Or, or is there something that you really want to see more of? And just giving the person an easy way out. I'm a big fan of not saying that we can call back the person, but giving them an easy way out. Hmm. I do like doing that because especially if you're an account executive, I mean, do you want to do a meeting with someone that's not like, that doesn't want to meet with you? I don't, I don't want to do those meetings. Um, let's answer a question. Um, Abdul, I'll throw this question your way. Saul Peters asks, I have received a response on my email by my prospect asking for my availability and now they've ghosted it. How do you think we should take it? I've already tried texting, calling, emailing follow-ups in in mail. <laughs> Saul has done all of the channels. It sounds like besides showing up at the person's house. Um, what's the what's the move here, Abdullah? And then maybe like kind of think about how this could have been prevented as well. Um, could have booked it on the phone. Uh, maybe <laughs> pick up the phone, right? That's always the the answer. It looks like they've already done that. Change your call presence. Um, knock on their door. A lot of things you can you can do, but to prevent something like that, maybe add sense of value, add very specific to that company. But my leverage is on to the next, right? If they're not responding, you've sent everything else to them on to the next one, having that abundance of prospects. Because if someone's ghosting you, right? It's been a week, you sent the calendar invite. The, to a point, you kind of have to understand the value of your time. Are you going to be able to collect a couple more prospects rather than spend this on that one prospect. So a little bit of understanding your losses is see if they've truly done everything On to the next. Yep. You got to know when to move on. Will, are you going to say something? No, I, I think it's, it comes on to the same thing we said earlier, like the best, uh, the best way to handle things is sometimes just prevent them. So just to make sure everything you do up front, the research, the people you're targeting, the meetings that you book, have a good agenda um the emails you send are actually relevant and personalized like if you do the prep work my my my, my uh father-in-law he's like very hands-on guy he's like blue collar total opposite of me because i don't i didn't know how to use a drill when i first met him um he, he always kills me because i always make cuts wrong he says measure twice cut once so again it's like the idea that do more to prevent than like trying to execute so if you can give people a relevant reason if you can set a good agenda if you can send right reminders if you can get confirmation and buy-in, then you're going to have less of this anyway. Um, yeah. I got another thought here too. I think that salespeople sometimes make it unnecessarily difficult for a prospect to find time with them. Hmm. So the extreme version of that is someone responds to my cold email and says, yeah, sure, let's meet. And then I respond with, does next week work for you? That's a lot of work for the prospect to do. Now they got to look through the schedule, find a specific time. It's harder to do all of that work than it is to just reply yes or no. And what mm -hmm. I want to share with you, this is kind of like a, a template that you could use. Um, I think it was when they were called exec vision. I don't know who they're owned by now. They did a really big study on do people prefer to schedule through calendar links? Do they prefer for you to recommend times or do they prefer recommending times themselves? And what they found is that it's about a third, a third, a third. So people have a lot of different preferences. There's a couple of things that when you're scheduling meetings will make it way easier. Like you need to really think like an executive assistant. One of them is list two times and days out manually. So do bullet points, list the days out manually. There are some executives, it might be a generational thing. Scheduling links drive them crazy. Yep. Oh, it it feels like you're making them do all the work. 
convert the time zone too. I'm so big on this. If if you're Pacific time and a prospect is Eastern time, convert the times into Eastern time. Don't make them do the conversion from Pacific. Like some people are not good at that also. So it's a lot of work. Again, you're making the person do reduce friction. Leave the scheduling link in there. That Leave that as an option and then let them know that they can recommend days or times too. The other thing that you could do here is if, if it's a really senior person at a big company is you could say, and of course, feel free to loop in your EA, who I'm happy to work with to find time. Mm. So giving people options, you just got to think about if you're having trouble scheduling or people are ghosting when they said yes to an email, and this is even like scheduling next steps with companies or with prospects that are in an active sales cycle too. Don't make it hard for people. Reduce Some the friction. Better. Better. Absolutely hate this, Jason. But to your point, if someone agrees to a meeting with me, I don't like doing the whole schedule tennis thing and listing out times and all that. So I'm just going to yeet out an invite. <laughs> and Jen, Jen my, my friend Jen Allen, our mutual friend Jen Allen, because he hates that. But I'm like, I'd rather you literally like have my fingernails pulled up and tr do more scheduling. So I'm just like, okay, I'll ping, I'll ping you an invite for Wednesday at this time. If that doesn't work, here are two others that does, or here's a reschedule link. Same number of emails, yeah. but now the invite's out there. And if it does work, all they have to do is click one button. Um, so um, now very direct works for me. I run my own business so it, I can get away with being a little bit more <laughs> bullish like that. If you're an SDR booking meetings for an account executive, the account executive probably will not appreciate you yeeting a, <laughs> an invite onto their calendar that is like a tentative, right? Um, but <laughs> if someone said, yeah, I'm interested in a meeting yeah. and it's my calendar, I'm booking meetings for myself. I'm going to, I'm going to eat that thing out there. I'm, I'm, I'm with you there. I was going to say, because, uh, I give that if it, if the SDR AE, if whoever has this uh, situation come their way, that is what I recommend. So like you, if you've emailed them a whole bunch of times, called them, texted, like if you sent them a carrier pigeon, they still haven't gotten back to you, throw it on the calendar. Choose a time that works for, if it's your AE or at least just the individual SDR, they'll decline it or they'll accept it or just let them know in an email, propose a new time. I just sent you, uh, I'm, I'm taking a shot here. I just sent you a random uh, invite for later this week. More than likely, it's not gonna work with your busy schedule. Just let me know, I'm happy to move it around. Cause I think for me, what I always look at this, they said yes to meeting with you. Yeah. So make it incredibly easy for them. And also too, if it's in email, uh, hopefully your scheduling tool <coughs> Mix Max, um, makes it as click, <laughs> quick as a click of a button for them to schedule because I've had the same thing happen where if you just send a calendar, yeah. I've, I've also been on this side too. I love the schedule tennis. I'm going to steal that at will. I always say the calendar dance drives me absolutely bonkers. It's just, I hate it. it drives me crazy. So just make it super simple for me. Uh, and then Saul, I don't know if this was over a call that you first had him saying, I'm not really sure if it was all over email, but if you're on a call and my SDRs have had a few experiences with this, unfortunately, you got to book it at like on that call mm -hmm. do yeah. everything you possibly can to book it because i've also seen a lot of people like calls go 10 plus minutes and they're super engaged they're like oh yeah super excited to learn about mix max and then they go gone bye-bye yeah. forever yeah. so you got to get them booked on that call the moment there's interest yeah. or there's a problem that you think you solve book don't even let it go out along the mind because the only thing that can happen is they either get taken away or they lose it you say something that puts like doubt in their mind so yeah. if you get the interest Ask the meeting, and then we'll get one of those objections that we're going to talk about for the next 10 minutes if it doesn't work. But if not, then uh, you've got it. Yeah. Book that meeting. Leave okay. the call on a high. You want to be the person that ends the cold call early, right? Um, let's talk about already have a solution. So, Jack, let's kick this one your way first. Um, let's say someone says they're already using... Uh, it could be a, comp a direct competitor. It could be, we do it ourselves. They're they're doing something to get the job done in this area. How do you kind of think about this one? We get hit with this all the time because we're going into a super saturated market. Everyone, sales engagement is like one of the first things teams get now, um, aside from a CRM. So more than likely they're going to have something. And if they're not, holy shit, you're super lucky that you caught someone like that. But at the end of the day, when it comes to it, you got to look at it from they're using a competitor. So that means they are value, like they actually find value in this tool. That's awesome. So that's one thing to really acknowledge and say, hey, awesome. Um, but also, too, it's, it means that they have budget, which is really good, too. So that the few different things, if, if they say, hey, we're using a, another sales engagement tool. Oh, great to hear. 
a lot of times people I call, they actually don't have anything in mind or have anything in play. It's great to hear that you're finding value in it. You're using a tool already. Curious, what tool are you using? I think I'm really big of find out what they're using. Cause then if you get off that call, find what that tool is uh, and then keep the conversation going from there. Scale one to 10, be honest. Is it a perfect 10? Most often you can't really say that about uh, tech right now. You know, where does it fall in your scale right now? Uh, that's a really good one that people tend to, they'll give a number, but they normally will give you like a spiel about why that is, which is always funny to hear. Um, so there's a few different ways, but I'm really big about acknowledging it's great you're using a, a solution already. That's awesome to hear. What, you know, how's the experience been with it so far? What teams are using it right now? There are a few different uh, questions we tee up. Hmm. Ab Abdullah, you guys probably run into this a ton with Zoom Info too. Um, yeah, same thing is just acknowledge the competition, right? That's great. I kind of expected that you'd be, you'd have another solution in place. That's kind of why I'm calling you, right? You understand the value in the solution. Just checking in. How's, how's that going for you? What do you love about it? Right. What do you hate about it? And you know, like the, the thing I like to go to, if it's, if the prospect is in a joyful tone, similar to me, I'm like, Hey, we're a couple of grownups. We never get to play pretend. What if you had a magic wand? What would you fix about it? Yeah. Right. Just be blunt, yes. be quick to the quick to the point and see where we can fit um, the solution that we may have. And if there's nothing there, it's like, hey, have you have you reassessed your solutions in that regard? Can we consolidate any of your tech stack? I know budgeting is always a problem with the economy right now. Would love to see where we could cut some of those, you know, loose money that, that we're not really yeah. putting to full use. Love it. I'll, I'll throw one more in. I love pros and cons. So if I was selling sales, like if I was calling for Mixmax, uh, an example of what I might say is, hey, that's great. You're using a tool already. I, I am curious because I hear from a lot of sales development leaders that what they really love about these tools is like how robust they are. But one of the things that I hear is that getting AEs to use some of those sales engagement tools because they're so complicated, like the adoption is really low. You know, what's your experience, Ben? So mm -hmm. if you know the pros and cons and the competitive battle card, always do the pros. Hey, I hear that's great because of this reason, but you know, sometimes I hear this, mm -hmm. what's your experience been? Or how, if you have a, a more specific question you can ask too, um, yeah. we got to keep moving you guys. I want to get to this other one because budgets a really common one. Um, and I think we're back to will on this one, uh, budget prospect says, I don't have the budget. We're on a hiring freeze, budgets tight, et cetera. And let's say it's a, a couple minutes into the call. It's not in yeah. the first 30 seconds. How do you think about handling this one? Uh, I will, because the budget and solution ones are probably two of the ones that I think can be real or are, even though I'm not the right person can sometimes be real. And I want to dig into that a little bit more. <clears throat> the budget one, I'm again, I just want to, I want to understand a little bit more because frankly, most people don't have a set budget per year for software tools, which isn't why I sell anymore. Most people do have a learning budget, which is now what I help teams with. But most of the time people don't have like, oh, I have, $50,000 pegged over here, ready for an e-sign software that we're not already using. Like that's just not, most people don't have a budget sign. So instead what I'm going to say is like, yeah. hey, no, I totally get it. No, it's a tough time right now. But you know, keeping tools, buying new stuff, et cetera. When you say you don't have budget, is that because your CFO would throw their calculator at you if you even suggested spending more money right now? Or is it more like you don't see problem area as something that's worth investing in or is going to see any return? So then I'm going to just try and whittle that down to try and better understand is budget like a, is it like a dead thing? We're never going to spend any money. There is zero dollars in the bank or, or zero dollars available, no matter what I do in the bank. Or is it like, I just don't see the value in fixing that, that particular problem that you've put on my plate by cold calling me. Um, and that can then allow me to dig a bit deeper and see if that really is maybe not worth investing in. If it's not, that's all good as well. Right? Like we said at the start, if it's not a problem, I'm not going to try and sell it to them. Uh, if, but I've, I want to know if it's not a problem, not just take the knee jerk reaction for it. Jack, Abdullah, you guys got anything different on this one? Um, the, the approach I go that I have my team kind of go with is like that ROI, right? Like everyone wants to return on their money. So if, it, if something's too expensive, just kind of understand, Hey, like what, what did you find value in the tool at the very least? Um, and better understand like what is their, you know, average sales price per product and kind of show it to them and uh, Hey, okay. Like let's say zoom info is 15 K and the cost of this company's product is around 5k, right? If I can bring you three clients, you've paid off a year of this product. So 
So kind of putting that in front of them. If budget is still an issue, that's more of a reason to get in this call, right? A lot of people are trying to reassess their tools, see where they can save money. We'll do that for you during this walkthrough, kind of help you better understand what's going on um, within your company and where we may fit. There's something that you don't need to bring your wallet to, but rather so you can plan for the future. We can connect in a couple of months or in a month if this still fits um, within your you know, within your needs, because like everyone is always going to have no budget for anything. But at the end of the day, like this could be something that's saving you money in the long run. Yeah, yeah. I like that. And to get the conversation to be higher than the budget, make it about like the insight that you can share too. You know, mm -hmm. this is like, I love using the, hey, that's exactly why I called. And then what I'd like to go do next is like, what value prop of your solution like helps with cost savings? Mm -hmm. So for example, like I work for the company that sells HR solution that kind of combines like five solutions into one. And it's, Hey, that's exactly why I called a lot of HR leaders we're working with right now are dealing with tight budgets and they have five different tools that they're using for benefits, recruiting, applicant yeah. tracking, and really looking to reduce the cost of that. Does, does it sound a bit like your world right now? And to get them talking about that. And it's like, I can show you how like HR leaders are thinking about consolidating tech stack you know so think about like what part of your value prop could align with cost savings and then that becomes the reason for the meeting you got to be careful with that too i don't want to start a sales cycle with so much focus around budget Agreed. you know um you guys this has been great i'm going to drop some resources in the chat make sure to check out zoom info mixmax mixmax has got 21 common sales objections and how to respond to them there's a link there and that document that I shared with you guys earlier, the Objection Handling Starter Pack, you can uh, download it there at that link. Um, real quick, before we take off, Will, where can people go to connect with you, man? Hit me up on LinkedIn. My, my DMs are open. Um, so, you know, if anything mentioned here today, I saw someone mention no-shows. I've got some cool resources. If you have any questions, I can always yeet you a video. By the way, the definition of yeet is give, throw, put out, because there were some questions about that in the chat. I'm sorry for saying yeet so much during this webinar. <laughs> Thanks, Jason. Go connect with Will on LinkedIn. Jack Abdullah, besides going to Zoom info and mixmax.com, is LinkedIn generally the best place to connect with you guys as well? Please, yeah. please. Blow my DMs up, always available. And I love hearing from, I'm an SDR leader, love my SDR. So please, if y'all want to connect, let's do it. And cold call Will because he said he picks up every cold call. So if you got something to sell to Will, make sure to give him a call after this as well. 902 916 <laughs> Five two four. Uh, well, let's do a role play. Gonna be the most replayed section of this webinar. Give it a spot for you to pick up all the cold calls now. Will to go get, get some, Zoom to get info some from Abdullah, and then that will have my number. I'm certain of it. <laughs> <laughs> all right, you guys. Thanks for the time, fellas. Thank you, everyone, for the engagement today. We'll see you. That's all we got. Bye. Yeah.